Thank you, Ellen. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for for having me. Um, I want to also thank the uh, Israel Academy of, of Science and Humanity also for inviting me to come on this on this journey. My presentation is okay, somewhere. So um, I was asked by by Ellen to come and talk about the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill, environmental and uh, social impacts. I have to be totally honest; it's not one of my favorite topics to discuss because it's depressing. Uh, but um, I'm going to hopefully talk. Well, I will talk about some of the depressing aspects, and hopefully at the end talk about some opportunities as well. Um, like Ellen said, I, I run the, uh, the Environmental Studies Program for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. That uh, program that, I, uh, that we do, I, I, uh, most people call it applied. I like to call it use inspired science, uh, science to inform decisions. So that's the basis of uh, the Environmental Studies Program that I, that I run. Okay. So, um, Outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a description of the Gulf of Mexico environment, uh, physical, biological, and socioeconomic, just to give you a background on what we're really talking about here, uh, the cause and effects of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and, the, and then the impact itself, both environmental and social, and then some conclusions and some lessons learned that perhaps will be informative to you. So, first of all, the physical environment. One of the first things we think about, or at least I think about, especially being from the South of uh, the United States, <coughs> is hurricanes. Uh, this is a hurricane map from 1900 to present. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of a lot of hurricanes, and um, you know every every year when it gets to be around August or September, um, you know you uh, you think, oh no, there's, there's another big one going to come. So we always have to think about that. Um, you can get a little cheaper tickets to Disney World. This last year I did take my daughter to Disney World and she's six year old and luckily we did not get a hurricane at that point. So it's a good time to go if you can miss the hurricane. Um, also, the, from the physical environment, the Mississippi River, 90% of the Gulf of Mexico freshwater. Look at this, how giant this is. This is a huge amount of, uh, of, of drainage area that comes off you know, farmland, rivers, Mississippi River, uh, uh, several, several other uh, rivers and streams that come into this, and massive runoff uh, from nitrogen farming activities right into the Gulf of Mexico. Next is deep water. About 20% of the Gulf is deeper than 3,000 meters. Um, so there is a, a substantial uh, area that's, that's relatively deep out there, um, and before the oil and gas industry, decided to go out and develop, or had ideas, prospects to go out and develop after they did seismic surveys, um, there was very, really very little known about the deep water. That's when we first started uh, discovering the deep water corals. I'll get into that in a little bit. Biological environment, <coughs> productive coastal uh, estuaries and, and wetlands. Um, if I recall, uh, about five million acres. So it's a, a huge, huge area. We have the unique habitats that I just mentioned, the deep water corals and some of the synthetic communities, communities that have off the, 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 the seeps, that, the hydrogen seeps that come out of the bottom of the ocean. Um, many uh, federally protected species, approximately uh, 132 or so. So you have a lot of, uh, of protected and endangered species from sea turtles to, to many, other, many other things, of fish. So, so it's a very rich biological environment. And then the socioeconomic environment. Uh, about 17% of the oil, 5% of the natural gas production for the United States uh, comes from Gulf of Mexico waters. Uh, tourism big business. I said that uh, people go down to, uh, to go to the beach, do many things from all over the United States, 
So we're talking here like at $20 billion in tourism annually. Commercial fishing. Um, there's a lot more than just oysters and shrimp, but I just wanted to mention to you that about 80% of the shrimp harvest comes from the Gulf, and about 60% of the, uh, the, the oysters harvested by right, right the Gulf of Mexico. Um, <coughs> a lot of people you know, think about the, you know, Alaska, where so much of the, the fish comes from, and, and it does, it does a lot, but uh, the Gulf of Mexico is a huge productive commercial fishery. Uh, outdoor recreation. <coughs> Again, I'm, I'm from the South. Everybody likes to hunt, uh, fish. Well, not everybody, but a lot of folks do. Hunting, fishing, birding. Very big. Very big business. You go down, you get a charter boat, you go out and fish around the oil and gas rigs. Um, the fishermen even name them after, you know, past girlfriends. So you're going out to see, you know, uh, <coughs> Ravenna, or you're going out to see Linda. <laughs> what is that? They actually will take you out to the different rigs to go to go fishing. Um, so it's a uh, big business, outdoor recreation, that, and uh, well, it was, uh, like I said, hunting, $25 billion into the U.S. economy annually. So, um, what caused the oil spill? Well, they drilled an exploratory well, a little over 20,000 feet. Cement job, it failed. Uh, and uh, and uh, it failed to fill up the, the, the reservoir, kind of the backup system, and the hydrocarbon flow started kind of going up. And uh, they weren't paying attention, didn't recognize it, something happened, human error. Um, before they knew it, the gas not in the rig, um, fire burst into, burst into flames, and uh, power whew, shut down. Um, the blowout preventer, which is supposed to be the backup for all this stuff, uh, failed. Failed to fill the well. So on April 20th at 9:49, uh, the first victim died, and then 11 more, <coughs> and then there were 10 more after that. So soon, I mean, real soon, the uh, the rig sank, and uh, the major oil spill happened after that. It's big. The biggest one ever uh, in, in U.S. Uh, waters, anyway. Um, the Ixtoc in 1979 was, was pretty big, which you see here in red. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So, um, and we're looking at uh, about 134 million gallons. I know here in Israel, you had a spill not very long ago, up here on shore, which was about 1.3 uh, million. So, um, we're just giving you an idea of the magnitude of, of how how much oil came out there. Um, if you look here, Exxon Valdez, which is big, um, but again, it's kind of dwarfed in comparison to Deepwater Horizon. <coughs> so, what happened to the oil? Uh, a lot of us uh, continue to, to talk about this. Um, and first, I guess, let me begin with the uh, Unified Command Response Operation. So, of course, all the, the Coast Guard vessels went out <coughs> at the command center, a um, bunch of the, uh, several of the federal agencies, uh, NOAA, Department of the Interior, people got together, uh, EPA, and, you know, tried to do really what they could with regard to recovery. So there was some direct recovery from the wellhead itself, about 17%, and uh, managed to burn about 5% off, and some of it was skimmed off, off the surface. Um, chemically dispersed uh, is about, about 8%. Um, residual here, uh, it just includes oil uh, that's just below the surface, um, and it was kind of, kind of washed ashore uh, and collected up, up on the shore, buried in the sand. 25% uh, evaporated or dissolved, and then naturally dispersed about 16%. Um, just to draw your attention to, I need to make the point here that um, I mean, most of you are probably aware that there was, uh, was a great deal of natural seep in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's made about 16,000 feet uh, with an average volume of about 72 gallons a day. Um, so over a year, the natural seeps that naturally come up out of the Gulf of Mexico is about a quarter 
of the entire Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So we have to keep that in mind because if this has happened over millions of years, of course, the, uh, the organisms in that ecology are going to be somewhat accustomed to this. Um, and uh, so this is, I think, real, real important to, to keep in mind as I, as I continue to walk, walk through this. <coughs> so, next question, where did the oil go? Um, in red, you see the really heavy, heavy oiling places. Um, of course, this is the Macondo well site. <coughs> Usually, instead of referring to deep water rising, we always say Macondo. So if I start saying Macondo, don't say that that's just the well. So that's, uh, that's usually the way we refer to it. Uh, so you got all the way from um, Louisiana over here through Oklahoma, New Orleans, and then down right by you know, Panama City, and then in this area. Um, it did not get entrained in the loop current. If it would have, it would have gone down to Miami. And that would have been <coughs> another problem. And, uh, this was a problem, but that would have been even something even more. Um, and it just so happened that this really heavy wind kind of pushed it up that way towards the, towards the coast, um, towards the bayou, towards the estuary. So um, again, either way, uh, it's, it's a bad situation. But uh, maybe it could have been worse if we got into the loop currents. So let's start trying to talk about the, uh, the impact a little bit. Uh, again, very productive type of ecosystem. Um, you had, uh, here you have oil in the, the mats here in the bayou, oil in the sediment, surface oil, as to the deep oil plume. Uh, so it's all the, way, all the way up and down here. So. I'm going to talk this, about this a little more specifically. I really want to, to talk about the wetlands areas that's out there, uh, uh, the, uh, the eroding marsh, um, and the, uh, the near shore benthos, uh, tarmacs, and again, all the sediments, and the benthic productivity, uh, the photic zone, the surface and dispersed soil, that may affect the base of the food web in general, and then the top predators uh, may be affected also on the food web, and I'll talk about that a bit, and marine mammals, and then the deep sea vent ecology, uh, the, the deep open, uh, ocean productivity. So, kind of giving you an idea, all up and down uh, in, in the nitropic areas, it's about some biological impacts. Okay, so let's start here with the photo Um So we saw a significant impact of ours. Um, Estimate and uh, you know when when something like this happens, we have the uh, uh, um, you know, NOAA is, is responsible to go out and do the estimate on the natural resource damage assessment, uh, the NERDA process. So a lot of these data are from NOAA. <coughs> Not myself, I didn't go out and collect these. Um, actually, any time that my program wanted to do a different study out uh, in the Gulf of Mexico while this was going on. Uh, anytime I proposed anything, I got this strange call from the Department of Justice lawyers saying, um, now what are you doing and why? What do you want to do and why? Because we don't want you to jeopardize the federal case against BP. So any kind of work that you need to be done, we need to clear it to make sure we're not going to overlap. So there was um, there's a lot of uh, the, the studies program that I run, it was, uh, it, it was, it was challenging sometimes to do, to do additional work because of what was going on with the nervous process. Uh, and they're the ones that had the damage assessment. Um, but what was that the estimates here, uh, so in the uh, floating zone, uh, two to five tri trillion with larval fish, uh, 37 to 68 trillion invertebrates floating on the surface. Estimate. Um, so, but for adults, some said that the estimates uh, were not believed to be as significant. Um, one, uh, uh, Actually, scientists from NOAA actually said there's not an additional major source of stress on the overall tuna population. Um, others definitely disagreed and said that uh, it's way too early to celebrate because we just don't know yet. So, but there was some uh, lab studies done on tuna control of the oil exposed, and of course there's obvious obvious impacts on the, on the oil exposed tuna. Is that going to translate uh, into uh, problem with the adult population and the fishery in and of itself? 
maybe, time will certainly tell. Um, after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, uh, it took several years for the herring population to crash up around Alaska. We do know that. Dora will still break. Nearshore impacts. <coughs> Almost all nearshore habitats were impacted. So, again, estimates about 563 kilometers to about 1160 kilometers shoreline were oiled. Uh, loss of submerged aquatic vegetation, and uh, again, some losses may be permanent in those restoration projects going on. Um, we have to also remember that uh, uh, by the time this session is over in the Gulf of Mexico, another whole football field will be underwater because uh, that's, uh, you know, how quickly subsidence is actually going in the Gulf of Mexico. So, so by the time we're over, we're going to lose that much um, so that they, it, it subsides is, a, is an issue in, in the near shore. So, and as I mentioned earlier, commercially important uh, estuary independent species were impacted. Estimates of about a, a billion oysters, uh, up to 500 million shrimp, and two to 10 billion blue crabs. These numbers are very big. They're so big, it's so kind of hard to get your head around <coughs> some, uh, some of these effects, but they're quite large. Um, marine mammals. Um, for there was an, an unusual mortality event uh, that was that was um, observed. Uh, you know um, that there was an estimated reduction of perhaps 62 percent in Mississippi Sound bottlenose dolphin population, which is a specific uh, population in Mississippi Sound, um, could have been reduced. Um, there's also a prevalence, uh, just in general, for marine mammals uh, of other health problems um, that, were, that were in the old uh, footprint. Uh, a lot of, of course, we were talking talk about marine mammals and their surfacing, breathing in uh, the, the oil can really uh, impact lungs and other internal functions. So that's part of the, the problem there. Um, Five species of sea turtles that live in the Gulf of Mexico, all endangered, were impacted. Uh, this guy right here does not look very happy. Uh, the Ken Fridley turtle. Um, and again, the sea turtles, they like to go up bask in the sun. And so uh, the most acute effects, of course, were from contact. So estimated 4,900 to 7,600 adult sea turtles and more juveniles. Birds. Uh, Gulf of Mexico is a huge flood. Um, birds fly across, they, they feed, um, so there's a, a huge impact coming in. Uh, impact observed were anemia, weight loss, hypothermia, feather damage, and tens of thousands of birds um, were impacted, and uh, many of those are believed to be adult breeding birds. Again, Jury's still out to an extent on how that's going to affect things down the road in the ecosystem in and of itself. Deepwater coral habitats. We were able to uh, actually some of this is, is a study that I that I worked on now, or that I funded. Because I'm the manager now, I don't really do science anymore. I just talk about it. So, <coughs> but that's okay. Um, so 25 deepwater coral habitats were surveyed here. And uh, we found three with uh, spill-related impacts. One was about 11 kilometers southwest of the wellhead, another about six kilometers to the south, and then one uh, slightly impacted 22 kilometers. Um, so we looked around uh, this area, and uh, we've been trying to go back and, and revisit. And you can see uh, these uh, Gorgonians here from November 2010, December, March 2011, October 2011, March 2012, November 2012. It's a little dark, but uh, hopefully um, so you can see that um, <coughs> that the uh, recovery of this is, is, is very limited. Um, this is one of the first times we had found uh, these species out there that that were actually dead. Um, I mean, hundreds of they were hundreds of years, so. Uh, you know, it, luckily here we had uh, we had some baseline data to really really go from that was really really helpful. 
social impacts. Um, talk about the oil industry itself, commercial fisheries, and tourism and recreation. So I'll talk about the, these three broad areas a bit. Um, you know, when you talk about the socioeconomics of, of the Gulf of Mexico, it's very important to, to look at the oil industry. Um, about 30,000 uh, 30, people work in the uh, offshore oil industry, and that's people that kind of work more offshore, but there's, you know, there's indirect um, kind of uh, people that also participate in, the, in that sector with regard to um, um, the um, pipeline companies, the rig fabrication companies, people that do the catering out there, it's all connected. Um, so, uh, you know, during this time there was a deep water drilling moratorium, so there was a lot of kind of drama and social disruption in these small communities. Believe me, there's a negative synergy going on with the other, other industries. These are fishermen, and they're not happy. You can tell that. And I hate to mess with this guy right here. So they're there listening to what went on, and uh, so between these three big, big ones, commercial fisheries, oil and gas, tourism, a lot of tension, a lot of negative synergy going on. Um, then there's the impact of the response efforts. You know, you have people coming in, Okay, to, to the, the, the responsible uh, party, social disruptions, and there's winners and losers. They hired a lot of folks um, that were from outside that had the skills to clean up, but at the same time, uh, that created a lot of tension within the community. Uh, commercial fishing um, impacts uh, were dispersed to the supply chain across the various states, and some species were uh, significantly impacted. These guys right here. Collins Oyster Company out of business after 90 years because of BP's oil and Governor Jindal's fresh water. They, in an effort to try to keep the oil from coming up into the uh, closer to shore, they pumped a lot of fresh water right out into the Gulf of Mexico over the oyster beds. Any scientist fish probably could have told you, don't do that. You'll kill the oysters. Well, they did. So these guys, uh, so that happened. That's why science informed decisions are so important. Again, tourism and recreation, big business, about 20, 20 billion a year. Uh, communities that were economic diverse, with economic diversity definitely fared better. Um, claims making like crazy. People were claiming that the restaurants went out of business, the hotels went out of business. The impact of the oil impacted here. The claims were all up and down here. The darker ones are the, you know, up to 50, I mean, I'm sorry, up to um, more than uh, five. Um, million up here. So there's, there's these all over the Gulf of Mexico claims making, my, you know, my, my tourist industry, my business, my restaurants. So people were making these claims, so there's a lot of misperception um, actually going on out there, financial loss, and what the real impacts were. So if, you know, the impacts are perceived as real, they're definitely real in their, in their consequences, you know, again, the claim costs. Um, the folks, you know, would make these uh, the various types of claims, uh, that the seafood was tainted and uh, the, in, the impacts were, were, were occurring. I mean, we're even in the D.C. where I, I live, people stopped eating Gulf shrimp for a long time. And uh, so there was definitely impact. And people said, oh, well, I'm not going to go to Florida this year, I'm going to California. Even though the impact might, may not be directly related to the spill. But still, the best way to tell if a fish is tainted, you smell it. It stinks down here. Um, so again, uh, so under, understanding these impacts overall is complex. Um, a lot of times fisheries closures actually lead to benefit fish populations. Um, and the fishery was closed for a while. In the long term, is this going <coughs> to be the case? Or are we going to see impacts in adult fish from the, from the impacts on the, on, on the larva and other things? Um, so we know, um, you know, that uh, well, what some of these in impacts were, but kind of the long term versus the short term, we're still out, and the jury's still out a bit. So, uh, one thing that's critically important is to continue to do, or to do long term ecosystem monitoring and look at environmental and, and social impacts. You have to have that baseline data in place, and then if some, an event happens, or if it even doesn't, um, then you're able to either you know, assess that. That, that effect. And, and the long-term monitoring really allows you to understand ecosystem change. Um, if anything good comes out of 
of this. Uh, oil spill is going to be the opportunity to do more science and to do more long-term ecosystem monitoring. I think um, at least $500 million, we know, will go to the National Academy of Sciences for environmental monitoring. I've met with them once or twice or a hundred times, can't remember, uh, to emphasize the importance of the, the, uh, the long-term monitoring in the Gulf of Mexico and to set up a a kind of systematic, standardized protocol uh, across the entire Gulf of Mexico. These long-term data sets, um, we, for example, have been monitoring the flower garden banks, which is a coral reef habitat uh, in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, about one mile away from an oil and gas rig, still one of the healthiest coral reefs in the northern hemisphere. How do we know that? 25 years of data. So it would be excellent to be able to continue to do this type of ecosystem monitoring across the entire Gulf. And I'm uh, very happy to hear that Israel is heading, heading in this direction. So, thank you. Thank you, Rodney. We have uh, time for two questions. Uh, Jack and then uh, Yuval. I knew it would be Jack, because Jack always, the last time I was here, talked about that. Wow, uh, that's a good question. I mean, the numbers are so big. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but um, there has been, of course, a significant increase. It's very one of the biggest challenges when you're going out to do science in the Gulf of Mexico now is not to duplicate what somebody else is already doing because there's so much going on. Um, one of the problems is that it's the, it's the coordination of all those different things. So there's a lot of uh, uh, money going to Texas A&M, and Sherry will talk about uh, some of their science, uh, but also throughout the five uh, coastal states down there. Um, I mean, that's a really good question, but I don't have any number I gave you would be wrong. So. Order of magnitude more. Order of magnitude more. 25% uh, more. That's probably wrong. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, there certainly has been some, uh, some effort to, to study that a little bit more, but you know, the, the oily bacteria that was down there, when the dispersants went out, that, uh, uh, those bacteria didn't, didn't function to eat the oil to the, to the extent that they would without it. So what you have is uh, maybe even some have claimed more of an impact by, by using the dispersants than by, than by not using it. Um, again, overall, I think the, the jury is still out. Uh, Maybe a chemical oceanographer like Sherry knows more about this than, than I do, but uh, I think that's, that's a very important question. Mm -hmm. Do so. you want to ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. I have yes. a couple of questions uh, based on the experience uh, learned from the Exxon Valdez uh, still in 89. Mm -hmm. I just visited, visited the site a couple of months ago, and people claim it still is not recovered. So I would like to ask. Uh, Two questions. One is about the restoration uh, uh, plan, uh, and especially if you have any plans for dealing with contaminated sediments and contaminated areas, uh, because we know, again, from the accident that there is some of the treatment was more harmful than the, uh, the actual effect on the The second question is that after the accident of this, the Oil Pollution Act was uh, revised substantially. Uh, is there a need now for a further revision based on the Um, I guess I'll start with the last one first. I think, yes, there is more <laughs> need for more revisions because a lot of what we, uh, what we did uh, learn from Exxon Valdez, it seems like we have repeated certain things when we go from Mexico. While there's a lot of restoration efforts going on, it's different also because you're dealing with wetlands and bodies. It's just that, uh, as I said earlier, you're talking about 5 million acres. So um, 
while there's money being pumped into the restoration effort, there's, uh, you know, there's, it's really complex on, on how to, to deal with it. The long-term effects, again, um, you know, biologically, I think you know, they are there and no time will tell if they recover. The social and economic effects as well. I mean, even if, you know, for Exxon Valdez, for example, uh, you know, 20 years, 20 years later, uh, a fisherman might get paid off with certain money, that, but their livelihood is gone. Um, so when you see even, even the, 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 these claims and disbursement of money in some of these small communities cause, cause a social disruption and, and long-term socioeconomic issues. Um, but I definitely think we need to, uh, to take another look at the law and, uh, you know, when something like this happens, I think it's uh, in our best interest and our duty to do that. Thank you very much.